We're going to go ahead and get started. It's noon. Welcome to the third inner system COVID-19 grand rounds. Today we'll be covering four topics, immunology, epidemiology, testing, and vaccines. These virtual grand rounds have been a great opportunity for our colleagues and local physician experts to share their knowledge and answer our questions. I would like to thank our panelists and our organizers, and a special thanks to Dr. Amy Case, who conceived of the idea of the virtual grand rounds and brought it to fruition. The Q&A session will begin after all four presentations. There were many questions submitted and a lot of those will be answered during the presentations. You're welcome to submit questions via the chat feature that we will get to at the end of the presentations. So let's get started. Our first speaker, and I'll introduce each one before they tackle their subjects. Our first speaker is Dr. Sheena Kandaya. Dr. Kandaya is a faculty member and associate professor in infectious diseases at Emory University School of Medicine. Her main role is serving as the medical director of antimicrobial stewardship, and she's also the associate hospital epidemiologist at Grady. Dr. Kandaya's topic today is COVID-19 immunology. Welcome, Dr. Kandaya. Hi, everyone. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to give a talk. This group has been wonderful to work with, and thank you to Amy Case for putting this together for us. Um, I'm gonna talk about immunology, and it's gonna be sort of a brief, synopsis of the, what we know about the immunology of COVID-19. I think much will be covered in testing and vaccines as well, which would fill in the gaps, but um, I'm gonna talk briefly about that first. So, Dr. Kandai, you're muted now. Sorry, my slide, oh, there we go. Okay, now we're moving. Okay, uh, I have nothing to disclose. Um, objectives today, I'm going to describe the SARS-CoV-2 virus, I'm going to illustrate the host virus interactions and describe the timing of antibody development with respect to symptoms and illustrate potential drug therapeutic targets as well. So I have to do all of this in 10 minutes, so I'm going to probably talk pretty quickly, so um, bear with me and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them afterward. Um, so I'm gonna talk briefly about the viral classifications. There's four known human coronaviruses, um, and all of these four actually uh, present as your upper respiratory tract infections. There are three that rep replicate in the lower respiratory tract, all of which I'm sure you're all aware of, MERS, SARS-CoV-1, and of course, SARS-CoV-2, which we're talking about today. SARS-CoV-2 is a beta coronavirus, and it's closely related to the SARS-CoV-1 um, with about a 79 to 80% similarity, um, but it's more closely related to the bat coronavirus coronavirus RATG13, which is 98% um, similarity. There is also some data that there is similarity between viruses from pangolins, which I think um, many of you have probably seen, um, but it hasn't, there wasn't a whole lot of information about that out there. So um, what we know about the actual virus itself, um, phenotypically, it's an envelope virus, which means that the envelope is easily disrupted by detergents and bleach. And this is why it's critical washing your hands and cleaning uh, the environment is so important for this virus. Um, it's two to three times more sensitive to UV light than influenza with a tenfold survival decrease with five degree temperature um, increases. And then there's a tenfold survival decrease with two to three days in the sun. So it's made up of several proteins. Um, the S protein, which is probably the most important protein, which binds to the host cell um, via the receptor binding domain. And this is important for therapeutics, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, and it binds to the ACE2 receptor with an affinity of 20 times greater than SARS, which is why it's so much easier to spread. Um, the S1 is, it binds to the host cell receptor, and the S2 mediates the fusion of the viral and cellular membranes. Much of our antibody testing is directed at um, the S1, um, but this, it depends on what, what specific antibody tests you're actually using. Then there's the membrane protein, which is most abundant, and it defines the shape of the viral envelope. Um, and it's ultimately the central organizer of the viral, um, of the viral assembly. See that right? The E protein is the smallest envelope protein, and it's integral to the assembly and release of the virus. And um, during replication, it's located, localized at the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus. Between the M and the E, it turns the host cells into a workshop for basically checking out replication of virus. 
Um, the viral envelope, which is the outer layer, layer, is derived from the host cell membrane, and the capsid is a protein shell which encloses genetic material. Um, the end protein is within the capsid, and it binds to the virus single-stranded RNA um, and inhibits the host cells from um, the host cell defense mechanism and also assists with replication. Um, there's a lot of information, I think, on these slides, and um, I know people always tell you don't put too many words and look at a lot of pictures, but I don't think this is, I think that for in this situation, I think that in order to really understand, you really need to have the words associated with the picture. Um, so transmission of the virus is primarily a via respiratory drop, droplets with a um, possible fecal oral transmission route. Um, the median incubation period is four to five days before the symptom onset, 97.5% symptom development within 11.5 days. The viral load peaks at five to six days of a progression to ARDS, usually around eight to nine days. The immune response oops, um, leads to a sepsis-like syndrome, which I'm going to get into in just a moment, um, uh, uh, like with the cytokine type storm. Um, the, the typical symptoms of COVID-19 generally are fever, dry cough, fatigue, um, and nausea, which is not on this list, generally will occur um, in 15 to 30 percent of people as well and is pretty well described at this point. Um, as you all know, um, there is also asymptomatic um, patients as well, or at least mild symptoms that are not necessarily recognized as symptoms of COVID-19 as well. Okay, so this is the pathogenesis. So if you can imagine, this is your endothelial cell in, in, your, in your lung. And um, the S protein, I'm going to try to use a mouse here to, to describe it. Here's your ACE2 receptors. The S1 protein generally will bind to the, the ACE2 receptor. And the cell proteases, specifically this one, which is important, I'll tell you why, is otherwise known as the T protein, um, cleaves the virus and allows for entry into the cell. Um, material can also be entered into the cell by endocytosis. Within the cell here, uh, within the cell here, um, probably right about here, the, there's several um, proteases that exist, which is why protease inhibitors are actually considered um, uh, as potential therapeutics, which ultimately replicates in the um, endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus. And from there, something called pyroptosis occurs, which is basically aggressive cell death, um, which creates a pro-inflammatory state. And this is where we start our cytokine release and recruitment of our monocytes, T cells, and macrophages. I want to actually just note here that you don't necessarily see recruitment of neutrophils. So once the recruitment of the monocytes, T cells, and macrophages occur, there's a release of interferon gamma, which basically releases more inflammatory cytokines, leading to this forces out of the barn type um, syndrome of cytokine storm. And we'll, you'll see many other cytokines outside of the ones listed here. IL-6 um, is just one of them. But I think it's a it's a very important mechanism because how your the host responds to this is going to basically determine um, their recovery. And what I mean by that ultimately is that under normal healthy immune system, the T cells will eliminate the infected cells before the virus can spread. The neutralizing antibodies will block the viral infection and alveolar macrophages recognize neutralized viruses and cure them by phagocytosis. So, um, and this results ultimately in minimal lung damage resulting in recovery. But as you can see in a lot of our patients, that's not what happens. And what we, what we get is what we call, what, a, what I'm gonna call a dysfunctional immune response, which is you get an excessive infiltration of the monocytes and the macrophages and T cells, again, not um, neutrophils. And you get a systemic cytokine storm um, where all of these um, all of these cytokines are released all at once, and basically this is where the horse is is out of the barn, and the T cells are fighting to sort of keep up. And at some point, they develop what we call T cell exhaustion, um, and they have reduced functional diversity, resulting in severe disease. So that's the T cell part. Now the B cells actually um, also activate, and they 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 um, release non neutral They create non neutralizing antibodies, what we call a, an antibody dependent enhancement, um, which actually enhances replication. Um, and then then and that's mediated through a complement pathway. And the reason all of this is really important is that it's um, when we look at immunosuppressants such as uh, such as um, GCSF, and we look at um, IL-6 inhibitors, monoclonal antibodies, interferon gamma, all of uh, tumor necrosis factor um, inhibitors, things like that. All of these are really important in this cascade, depending on which is probably the most active. Um, and 
complement inhibitors, which haven't really been mentioned as much, are actually do have a role um, in in um, in stopping this this uh, cytokine storm. So this is actually just a, a picture of a of a um, a cell, and you can see that the virus here is binding with your 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 S protein is going to be binding with your ACE two receptor. Again, it's going to be cleaved by the T protein, um, which comes in. Which, which allows the entry of the virus into the cell. Again, this is important because there are drugs out there. So I, I'm not familiar with this because this is not an American drug, but camostat mesylate is actually one of the ones that are, are um, being considered in other countries, um, which prevents viral cell entry. Um, and then also the Arbidol, which targets the S protein and S ACE2 interaction also are here. Um, and then, you know, there are, um, there are antibody, and our block, our, um, our antagonists as well. Um, trials going on specifically, I think Losartan is going on um, that I'm aware of. And you know, the thought of that is potentially some um, competitive inhibition with the ACE2 receptors that doesn't allow the, um, the SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, to actually bind to the cell, um, to the receptor. So then that chloroquine and the hydroxychloroquine, and also actually azithromycin tends to be more immunomodulatory, although it's not really clear. Um, it, it theoretically could, could inhibit viral entry and endocytosis again through multiple mechanisms. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the, once the, once the um, virus is within the cell, um, the virus is cleaved several times by multiple proteases. Um, and this is where our lopinavir, our darunavir, and some of our um, ribavirin, oops, the remdesivir and the favipravir actually are acting on these proteases, not allowing, which actually inhibit at the replication site. So ultimately, assuming that the virus gets through all of this, um, it will assemble and then it will go, it'll be, it'll, it'll replicate, it'll assemble, and it'll be released through exocytosis um, just to go back and do more damage. So antibody development. The response to the antibody generally arises first against the nucleocapsid protein due to its abundance. There's a lot of nucleocapsid protein. It's very sensitive, but not specific, and there's a large amount of cross-reactivity to this nucleocapsid um, protein. Um, in four to eight, di four to eight days, um, the spike protein um, will will actually, the antibody will start to develop to the spike protein. And that's a little bit more uh, higher in the way of specificity. And the thought is that the nucleocapsid pro protein is actually a non-neutralizing antibody, whereas the S protein is more likely to be a neutralizing antibody, although clinically it's not clear what the significance is yet. Um, and as I mentioned, there is cross-reactive activity with other coronaviruses. Okay, so just in terms of timing, as you can see, if you were to do a nasopharyngeal swab on, um, you know, early when detection is unlikely, um, you know, within two weeks, usually symptom onset will occur, and then followed by um, usually antibody detection already by week two, usually seven to 10 days, you start to see antibody detection. Um, and this, again, may be may be important for vaccine development in terms of timing um, and uh, will help us sort of determine timing, timing of infection with regards to um, transmission. It's, it's important for epidemiology as well. So with that, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to just talk about outstanding questions. I think there's a lot that we don't know about the immunology. We have an idea based on other viruses of how SARS-CoV interacts with the host, but I think um, there are still outstanding questions. Like, does the strength of the antibody response correlate with the severity of disease? Does the timing of the antibody response correlate with severity of disease? And that I think is important, especially with patients who have persistently positive PCRs, which can, I think, um, over 40 days has been, has been um, described. Um, does the strength of the antibody response correlate with the viral clearance rate? I think a lot of work needs to be done with that. And then how does the strength of the antibody response affect your vaccine efficacy? Nobody knows. Um, so um, with that, I'm going to also just mention quickly about herd immunity. Um, you know, this is sort of a very basic slide, but you know, herd immunity, you need over 70% of people to be immune to actually reach herd immunity. And really the way to get there as we have with other diseases is going to be probably through vaccines more than anything else. Um, and you know, the, the intermittent relaxing of our social distancing um, is going to be likely going on ongoing, especially as the season changes as well. Um, so 
I don't think that herd immunity is on the horizon anytime soon, time soon. We think that there's immunity for the survivors, but again, we don't have enough information yet. It's too early to say. Um, so more to come. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kandaya. Our next speaker will be covering epidemiology and that's Dr. Danny Brandstetter. Dr. Brandstetter serves as medical director of infection prevention and infectious diseases at Wellstar Health System. He's an active researcher serving as a primary investigator on studies with the Wellstar Research Institute. He received his undergrad and master's degrees from Vanderbilt and his medical doctorate from University of Tennessee. And he's currently pursuing a master's in healthcare management at Harvard School of Public Health. So welcome Dr. Brandstetter. Good afternoon. Today, I want you to try to think about how infectious is this? Where might this have came from? And what's the fatality rate? But to do that, we got to look at some numbers. So what's your number? Is it cases? Is it death rate? Case fatality? Incident rate? But first, imagine with me, if you will, that you're a recent college graduate, graduating a semester early, December 2019. And to reward yourself, you've taken a trip, the trip of a lifetime, to Europe. And in doing so, you're seeing all the sights, having a great time. This trip is going to end with the greatest celebration, and it's New Year's. You're gonna sell at New Year's in Rome. Wow, what a trip. Shortly after you began your trip, you learned that there's a new virus circulating. Some people are having trouble. It seems to be deadly. And yes, it's circulating in Europe. You're scheduled to leave in just after New Year's. You plan to return to live with your parents. Being a recent college graduate, you don't have the means to live on your own. You've also heard that your flight may get canceled. International flights may get delayed. Do you end your trip early? No, you can't do that. This is a trip of a lifetime. So you decide to stick it out. You make it home. But now, who are you gonna live with? You've potentially been exposed, so the airline says, as there was symptomatic people traveling with you back to the United States. So, do you live with your parents? Both are in their mid-60s. Dad has diabetes and hypertension. Mom has obesity. You can go live with your brother, but he has a newborn child three months old at home. You still maintain contact with your old college roommate who graduated two years ago. She has her own place. She recently started chemotherapy. Take a moment, take a poll, and let us know what you think. Can we get the poll results, please? All right, 85% said you're going to go live with your brother. Great sibling. So let's think about how we got here. You've already heard that this virus is very similar to a bat coronavirus. And this is a phylogenetic tree, kind of a family tree, looking at where it fits in. You can see the coronavirus, the beta coronaviruses, um, are in the right-hand corner. Highlighted in red is the one circulating in China. The bat coronavirus you've heard about is on the lower list of red there. It's also similar, but not quite closely related to the coronavirus called MERS, as you can see with the blue arrow. So where did it come from? 
Did it come from a bat? It is very closely related. There definitely was some circulating in bats in open markets. Um, it is, uh, could be related to a pangolin, but also um, there's some coronaviruses in other animals, such as the civet. And I hear people like coffee, so um, watch out for those uh, specialty coffees, folks. The um, link here is that there are ones circulating in throughout the world are very much closely related um, and continue to circulate. So looking back in December, as the first cases were isolated in China, we see that the phylogenetic tree on the left, it's really busy, but just notice that it's pretty single lined. But we progress all the way through mid-March, as you can see, it's spread around the globe in quite a quick fashion. And we see a little bit of diversification going on, but still closely, closely related. Um, and it, within the United States and the South America, you uh, see the very similar regions as well as within um, China, there's still uh, very similar uh, strains circulating. So now that it's circulating, what about fatality? You've heard a bunch about, could this be as bad or worse than MERS or SARS or Ebola? What about other coronaviruses? Well, looking at this through May 15th, 2020, we can look at case fatality rate as taking the deaths over the known positives. And within the United States, we see about a 6% case fatality rate. Italy leads the way with 14%, but we see as low as less than 1% case fatality rate. So who among us are having trouble with coronavirus called SARS-CoV-2? If we look by age, our eight older population, 70 above, are bearing the brunt of this disease in case fatality. The example of several countries throughout the world, and we see similar patterns within the United States. And when we go further down within the United States, we see similar patterns within states. So how does this compare? So case fatality of 6% in the United States. Is that as bad as MERS? Well, it's about 34%. SARS-CoV-1 is about 10% case fatality rate. A very known entity to all of us throughout the world is influenza, has a 0.1 case fatality rate. Now keep in mind, case fatality rate is deaths divided by number of confirmed cases. So as testing increases and more screening happens and understanding of incidents within the population, case fatality rate will change. So what about non-infectious case fatality contribution to COVID-19? This is a report out of China, and we see that cardiovascular disease and diabetes are the top two trends. We see that also in the United States, in addition to age as a comorbidities are problems with COVID-19 as far as fatalities. What you don't see specifically listed on this graph is obesity but we're seeing that as a contributing factor to overall mortality, not only as a factor of itself, but also with known cardiovascular disease and its contributions to diabetes as well. One item on here that you do not see is smoking. We all know that smoking increases our risk for pulmonary pathogens, such as influenza and coronaviruses, such as SARS and COVID-19. It's interesting because it not only increases at risk for the damage that smoking does to the lungs, but also it's a risk of transmission as the hand comes toward the face and mouth for a vector of transmission. So how infectious is it? Looking at that, we look at reproduction number. How many people will one person affect subsequently? On the left-hand panel, you'll see an example of one person infecting one other. This is an R of one. The most common that you know about this that's close to an R of one is influenza. Other infections have a higher number of R. The example on the right-hand pane is four. One person infects four individuals. Those four individuals infect four more. And as you can see, that number quickly rises when the R is greater than one. 
So looking at and comparing to other known infections, SARS-CoV-2 falls somewhere between two and three based on our current data and understanding. Influenza is just a little bit greater than one, as you see at the bottom of this graph. And measles leads the way at around 14. Polio is around six. And HIV, interestingly enough, is around three. So all known infections that we deal with every day. Time for the second question. So imagine again with me, but this time you're an administrator of a senior living facility, which has a skilled nursing unit attached. You've just heard a wonderful Zoom talk about the risk of COVID. And you know that the testing is expensive and limited. And given your high level of concern for your residents because they're at risk, what do you do? Do you monitor any symptoms you just learned about? Develop a list of symptoms and screen with temperature twice a day? Or screen all your patients twice a day along with symptom check with a PCR test included? Please take a moment and tell us your opinion. Okay, can we get the poll results, please? All right, it looks like 75% of us want to screen all our patients proactively twice a day with temperature checks. And 25% of us uh, want to do uh, PCR-based testing with a symptom check. And about 7% just want to monitor for the symptoms you've heard about as they develop. So the CDC investigational team did just this. They wanted to know what is the prevalence within our nursing home and our elderly populations who seem to be most at risk. And what they found was that over 60% of the residents screen positive. But most of those are asymptomatic at 50%. But within four days, 90% of those did develop symptoms. So active screening can tell us a lot about our patients. So what does screening actually tell us? And we'll learn in a few minutes about PCR-based testing and what that tells us. But what we know is that infectivity, and that's being able to isolate a virus that is replication competent, meaning that it can form another virus, infect other cells, can be isolated from individuals about two days before symptom onset to approximately nine days post-symptom onset. Any sooner than that, probably is not replicative competent, meaning it does not have an infectious virus enough to spread, all the way out to nine days post-symptom onset. Compare that now with you for a second to actually detecting it by PCR. This can be seen as early as six days prior to symptom onset and as far out and probably longer as we'll learn, greater than six weeks post-symptom onset. So remember, there's a difference between detection by PCR and infectivity. So the takeaways from today, thank you for taking the time to take two quick journeys with me as a system administrator and as a former recent grad college student. What we've learned, probably that there's more to discover, that there's likely zoonotic transmission as a source. The case fatality varies. We have more to learn there but our elderly seem to have the highest rate and need to be most vulnerable with this infection. And then the infectivity, one person actually probably infects two others. Thank you for time today. Thank you, Dr. Brownstetter. That was excellent. Both, both talks have been excellent. And uh, remember to submit your questions via the chat function. So far, uh, we'll save those to the end. And our next topic, testing. Testing will be discussed by Dr. Bronwyn Garner. Dr. Garner attended Georgia Tech undergrad and the University of Michigan for her MPH and Medical College of Georgia for her MD. She did her residency and fellowship at Duke and afterwards did a one-year fellowship in medical microbiology at the University of Utah. She came home to Atlanta, good for us, and works at Piedmont Atlanta, practicing transplant infectious disease and providing microbiology support to Piedmont Health System. 
So welcome Dr. Garner for the big topic of testing. Thank you very much, Dr. Bowles. Let me share my screen here. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes, looks good. Awesome, okay. So thank you very much again, Dr. Bowles for the introduction. And I'd like to spend the next 30 minutes or so discussing testing. So buckle up and let's go. So just to sort of um, introduce testing concepts, um, there are a few basic ideas that we should review before jumping into testing. And this concept refresher will be pretty important when we discuss whether or not a test is accurate or can be trusted. And so bear with me as we continue on from Dr. Brandstetter's epidemiology journey to the testing basics epidemiology journey. So each test has the following performance characteristics. The first is analytical sensitivity. Um, the second is analytical specificity. And sensitivity is commonly referred to as the LOD or limit of detection of molecular diagnostics. And analytical specificity can be thought of as cross-reactivity. Both of these characteristics are determined in vitro and sometimes in silico as many of the cross-reactivity studies um, have been done for uh, COVID tests. And um, you know, again, these are all derived within the lab. Clinical sensitivity and specificity are the characteristics of the test when applied to populations. So when you hear people describing the sensitivity of a PCR, they're commonly referring to this statistic, the clinical sensitivity. Um, finally, the real number that clinicians want is a positive or negative predictive value. And that's demonstrated here. Um, these numbers are commonly referred to as false positive or false negative rates. And the trick to this number is that the prevalence of disease actually influences this characteristic. So um, as demonstrated on this graph, <clears throat> as the prevalence of, the, of disease goes up, the positive predictive value shown in blue here also goes up, meaning that the more common COVID is in the community, the more you can trust a positive test. On the flip side of the coin, the negative predictive value goes down, which is the green line here, as the prevalence goes up, meaning that the, the more common the illness is in the community, the more likely your negative test is a false negative. So this is a common issue in the middle of epidemics. Take, for example, the, the middle of flu season, a negative flu test is much less meaningful in a patient with fever and myalgias than it is in the middle of June. And this has nothing to do with the test ability to detect disease. Um, that part didn't change, just the prevalence of the disease changed. This will probably become a familiar graphic towards the end of the talk, but um, we also need to discuss important virology um, as brought up earlier by Dr. Kandaya. So here's the structure of SARS-CoV-2, important. Um, the main targets are the proteins on the outside here and some of the genomic um, RNA. Typically, you want to target preserved portions of the virus so that testing is re reliable and reproducible throughout um, seasons of illness. So here, this cartoon virion um, and schematic of its positive sense RNA sort of point to some common targets, um, which include the spike protein here, the nucleocapsid protein and its domains, the membrane protein, the envelope protein, and then also these ORF um, regions, and right here, RDRP um, domain on ORF1B. Just to um, note, the envelope protein is not 100% specific um, to SARS-CoV as discussed earlier, 
This protein is shared with other bat coronas um, and uh, can cross react. Um, epidemiologically, however, we think that SARS-CoV is the only currently circulating bat corona in the population. And so um, that cross reactivity is less important. So there are multiple molecular diagnostic assays on a variety of associated platforms that are currently available. Molecular diagnostics are the gold standard to diagnose acute COVID-19 disease. And they work by detecting the presence of viral RNA in the patient's sample. There are two main groups of molecular diagnostics currently available. The first group is comprised of high throughput assays that require multiple steps that are often automated, but sometimes not, to extract and then amplify the viral RNA targets. These tests typically hold 96 samples at once and therefore patient samples are run on high throughput platforms um, in a batched manner. Additionally, the footprint of these machines are large. Staff performing um, the test must have a high level of knowledge regarding molecular diagnostics and typically also must be good handy people at troubleshooting. I just wanted to show you how big these platforms are because I know that we've had a lot of questions in our institution. Why can't we add another one of these to our, um, et cetera. So this is the COBAS 6800 and 8800 um, instruments. You'll see they're pretty large and mighty. Um, this is the Panther Fusion that has both the TMA and the PCR module. This is the M2000, which is the Abbott uh, real-time PCR um, platform. So they're all quite large, um, large footprints. The second group comprises rapid molecular assays that uh, may be a part of, of, you know, like a syndromic panel such as BioFire. These tests have a faster turnaround time. And here I've sort of put together 90 minutes or less, although the, uh, typically we think of rapid turnaround as 60 minutes or less. They require less from lab techs compared to the high throughput platforms. And these assays run one sample at a time, so they're not batched, but it's a single sample. So your machine, is, your machine or part of the machine that's running that test is occupied for the duration of the, of the assay. Um, so turnaround time is affected by volume of tests and number of modules available to run the test. And so, you know, your labs might have something like the Gene Expert Infinity. Um, this also comes in smaller, smaller forms, but the Infinity can fit up, fit, fit multiple bays um, at one time. Maybe they have a biofire. This is the film array, um, two film arrays here. Or maybe they have an ID now, um, and that's what the ID now looks like. <clears throat> the commercially available assays have all received emergency use authorization or EUA from the FDA. And, and these evaluations are not full FDA evaluations. Instead, they're expedited reviews, meaning that the longitudinal study data about performance is unavailable. And the biggest pitfall of molecular testing here is false negatives. So um, that is important to note. Remember, this relates to the negative predictive value of the test, which is based on clinical sensitivity and prevalence. And things to think about whether or not um, the result is a false negative is what's the patient's pretest probability, which is particularly difficult with COVID-19 given its range of clinical presentations. Um, what is the sample site and what is the collection method? Um, let's move forward with talking about sample site and collection methods since those are a little bit easier to grasp and discuss. <clears throat> so where you take the sample from matters. Um, this table demonstrates uh, the clinical sensitivity based on upper respiratory sample site. Um, this table was uh, recently published in IDSA Diagnostic Testing Guidelines 
um, by Kim Hansen and um, other panelists. So uh, most people um, collect nasopharyngeal samples and note that that does have a good sensitivity and 97% with 92 to 100% 95% confidence interval um, or mid turbinate, which also has excellent performance characteristics here. Interestingly, saliva is making a splash as a convenient sample that could be used in home testing. Um, a new saliva test recently got um, EUA from the FDA. And this is a joint venture between Spectrum Diagnostics and Salt Lake City who manufactures the collection device um, that contains a proprietary viral transport media um, in Rutgers Genomics Lab who performs um, a laboratory developed real-time PCR assay on the sample. Um, so it's just another piece of human innovation allowing um, PCR data um, or giving patients access to PCR tests that may be homebound, uh, may not have testing available in their community, or may be too ill to leave their home. So after all that discussion about sensitivity and specificity, remember the real, the real um, diagnostic value is its predictive value because that's the uh, metric that includes um, so again, here we are discussing the recent IDSA diagnostic guidelines. Um, and recently they, uh, they estimated predictive values with a variety of sample sites and used a prevalence of 10%, which is um, definition of a hotspot. So while pre uh, positive predictive value of the test is important, um, the negative predictive value of SARS is extremely important. Um, false negative results to COVID-19 means that social distancing, self-isolation, and in the hospital, discontinuation of appropriate isolation may re lead to spread of the disease. And note that the worsening, um, uh, note that the worst performing sample specimen is oral swab, while nasal swabs have um, the best performance. Saliva, let's see if I can get my pointer to work, also has some false negativity here. So if you're curious then, well, what do we do if we think that the patient has, um, has COVID even though their, their initial test was negative? Well, the um, new IDSA guidelines also discuss this, and it's been an area of interest of mine here at Piedmont. How do we determine um, who's a candidate for repeat testing and what do we use to repeat their test as far as sample site goes? And how long do we wait between initial um, testing sample and repeat testing sample? So again, repeat testing helps to increase the identification of true positives and is most helpful with intermediate to high probability of COVID-19 disease. Again, prevalence of disease is important to determine the risk of, of COVID-19 in a patient. So you need to take that into account when you're evaluating the patient symptoms. IDSA guidelines recommends a testing interval of 24 to 48 hours after initial test returns negative. So when you get that first negative back, then you can reorder that your test 24 to 48 hours later. However, they do comment that specifically there are no studies to uh, evaluate the optimum testing repeat window, and this would be helpful um, data in the future. They also discuss additional testing sites, and here is um, the sensitivity and specificity of upper respiratory sampling compared to lower respiratory sampling um, as far as, you know, obtaining your positive um, PCR. And because lower respiratory tract specimens do have a higher sensitivity than upper respiratory tract specimens, repeating a lower respiratory tract sample um, in a patient with, um, particularly with lower respiratory disease is preferred for repeat. Um, 
but lower respiratory tract specimens may be difficult to obtain. Um, you know, you, caution, no induced sputum should be used um, due to aerosoliz potential aerosolization. Um, so upper respiratory tract specimen collection is still the mainstay of diagnostics, but if it's feasible to obtain, obtain a lower respiratory tract specimen, you may have better luck finding the virus there. But what about the flip side of the coin? Um, what about people who are asymptomatic? Do we test them? Who needs to be tested? When do we test them? How do we test them? Um, these are all really good questions that are just being answered. Um, I think most importantly, there is no data to indicate molecular assay performance in patients who have asymptomatic viral shedding or presymptomatic viral shedding. Moreover, there's little data describing infectivity of people with lower levels of viral shedding, and much is really unknown about the role of asymptomatic and presymptomatic spread because it's so difficult to study. So recent IDSA guidelines did use um, some studies of, recently the IDSA guidelines looked at two different populations where asymptomatic testing may be useful. The first population were people who had known high risk exposures to COVID-19. And the second uh, group of people were asymptomatic and unexposed patients, but were inpatient. So to answer the first question, um, IDSA used a, a series of studies of close contact transmission clusters to make the following recommendations regarding testing in asymptomatic people outside the hospital, but with likely exposure. Um, the panel evaluated studies that reported the prevalence of COVID-19 among asymptomatic individuals in household clusters, nursing home outbreaks, active surveillance of passengers quarantined on cruise ships, or passengers of repatriation, um, hospital employees with close contacts to COVID-19 positive patients, and customers and employees of a restaurant that had a COVID-19 outbreak. And interestingly, these um, studies all showed a pretty high prevalence, so between 10 and 50 percent. Um, and so therefore, these settings, um, one could conclude a substan substantial amount of transmission was, was um, occurring and therefore um, you were able to suspect high likelihood of transmission prior to testing. So if you assume the overall sensitivity rate between 75 and 95% to tests, you would expect some false negatives um, in this population. And because of that, um, moreover, testing of this population may not actually lead to any sort of actionable outcome because quarantine um, of this group would still be indicated. Um, moving on to the second group of people, um, one other thing that they discussed was when the best window was to test these asymptomatic but exposed patients. And again, there, there's no specific uh, no specific timeline, but it's recommended that perhaps five to seven days following exposure may be a reasonable time to consider post-exposure testing based on um, the current uh, thought that incubation period is determined to be about five days on average. So moving on to the second, um, the second group of people, which are inpatient um, asymptomatic and non-exposed patients, um, they really kind of came up with two different recommendations and then a gray zone. The first recommendation was to consider testing in admitted patients in high-risk areas where the prevalence is 10% or more. They recommend not testing in, um, in patients where the prevalence is less than 2%. Um, and they weren't really sure what to do with the in-betweens, the two to 9% range. And so basically, you know, you need to use your clinical judgment in those patients um, based on their epidemiologic risk of exposure um, and, you know, stay up to date with your local epidemiology. <clears throat> Finally, Maybe not finally, we still have antibody testing. Um, 
But replicating virus, this um, was covered and touched on briefly before. Um, you know, you have a patient, they're asymptomatic or they've gone, um, they're over their disease and they're still shedding this virus. And, and what do we know about that virus and its ability to, to, um, to create disease? So there are many ongoing studies to evaluate the viability of virus detected by PCR in COVID patients. Um, two such studies are discussed here. The first study was performed by Waffel and it looked at viral replication in nine German patients that were positive for COVID. Um, this detailed virological analysis provides evidence of active virus replication in tissues in the upper respiratory tract. Um, pharyngeal shedding was highest during the first week of symptoms and infectious virus was readily isolated from samples derived from either the throat or the lung. And while they were able to detect virus um, RNA by, by molecular methods in the stool, um, they were never able to culture it um, out of the stool. They never had a positive blood or urine sample or PCR. So active replication in the throat was confirmed by um, viral, replica viral virus replication in culture. Um, and moreover, they were also able to uh, detect independent replication in both the throat and the lower respiratory tract in a patient with severe disease who had PCR positivity from both sites. Um, typically, um, patients who were able to produce sputum also had replicable virus from the sputum. Um, and interestingly, the shedding of viral RNA of sputum outlasted the, the end of symptoms significantly. Most patients uh, had antibody detection um, seven days into disease and all patients by day 14. Um, but what I also found interesting in the study is that this was not necessarily followed by a rapid decline in the viral load. So in this graph on the uh, left-hand side of your screen, uh, kind of summarizes the data here. These are the symptom, this, these are um, days from symptom onset. This is the, um, oops. This is the uh, inoculation of virus resulting in positive culture from throat and nasopharyngeal swabs. This is inoculation of sample into viral culture um, that did not grow. And then here is this uh, seroconversion of patients. So again, you see um, you know, viral shedding um, despite uh, seroconversion, which I thought so we'll move on to this graph here. A second study performed by the CDC evaluated the first 12 patients with COVID in the United States. They detected viral RNA and cultured virus from upper respiratory specimens, even from patients with predominantly lower respiratory illness. They look at the, the crossing threshold values in upper respiratory tract specimens, and they were typically the lowest during the first week of illness, um, and low CT values corresponds with high viral load. Um, additionally, uh, RNA was detected in upper respiratory tract specimens for two to three weeks in most patients and for as long as 36 days in the most ill patient out of these 12. Um, sputum specimens were less frequently available, but those that were able to produce sputum, again, viral RNA was detected and it was detected longer in that sample type than nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal specimens. Um, they also were able to isolate um, viral RNA by molecular methods from the stool. However, they were never able to culture um, stool virus um, in the study as well. So what you're looking at here to kind of summarize this study is the Kaplan-Meier curve of, uh, and the survival is the virus survival um, on this side here and um, the days from uh, symptom onset is here. And so you note around nine days, here's the actual data, the dashed lines represent confidence intervals. Um, you notice that at day nine, uh, culturable virus approaches zero. 
So what's, what's important about this? Well, now we have data that regarding recoverable infectious virus, but there are a few drawbacks about um, these types of studies that we should discuss. First, while these studies are very interesting, especially to the virologist and me, um, it, it doesn't really answer the question of transmission at, at low levels of viral shedding. And second, um, viral culture can be difficult and sensitivity sometimes is poor. So it's possible that while in vitro, these lower levels of viral shedding didn't create a pathogenic effect in cell culture, transmissibility in the population could potentially exist. So um, really, we need to sort of understand immunity and transmissibility. And with that, we'll discuss antibodies. All right, guys, hang in there, almost done. Um, so antibody testing has been an area of great interest. Um, it tends to be quick, relatively cheap, can be done point of care, depending on the assay. Most tests are designed to detect IgA, IgM, and IgG, or a combination. Um, the convenience of a finger, finger prick and lateral flow assay in the office can sometimes come with the price of decreased uh, specificity, in particularly with the IgM antibody. Um, in this antibody section, we'll quickly review important uh, testing characteristics for interpretation, review IgG testing, as that's the most widely available and requested review um, antibody test, and it has probably the most epidemiologic significance. So real quick, let's take a look at our negative predictive value, positive predictive value graph. And here, for antibody testing, the positive predictive value is important and is tied to the specificity of the test. The specificity of the test is linked to the test's ability to correctly isolate an antibody for SARS-CoV-2 and nothing else that may be similar. Again, positive predictive value is based on specificity and prevalence. So if um, prevalence in our area say is 1.5 to 2% and we were using the first FDA EUA antibody test that has a, a specificity of 95%, that means that a positive result from this antibody test is three times more likely to be a false positive than a true positive. And because we are largely using antibody tests to determine prior exposure, this test will overestimate seroprevalence um, through false positives. I included here a website that allows you to do some cheat sheet math um, if you um, want to and also kind of lists out um, by assay. Again, that's virus schematic. Um, so similar to PCR, antibody tests look for um, kind of specific parts of the virus, but of course it looks for the antibodies made against those parts, um, particularly the spike in the nucleocapsid proteins. There are three types of antibody tests. There's a qualitative yes-no, there's a semi-quantitative, um, usually has a measurement um, with a, a positive negative cutoff, or a quantitative test. Classic ELISA methodology gives you um, tigers that you, you all are probably really familiar with. It's what you get with an RPR or an ANA. And tigers can potentially tell you more information about the robustness of the host response um, and may be helpful in determining immunity in the future. One basic concept of all SARS-CoV-2 um, antibody assays at present is that positivity does not equal immunity. We are waiting for data regarding detection of neutralizing antibodies with current tests and evaluation of length of production of these antibodies over time. And unfortunately, those types of studies require time and SARS-CoV-2 is obviously quite new. So as we move forward to discuss antibody testing, we know that these tests are important epidemiologic tools to evaluate zero prevalence and at present do not indicate immunity. So these next few slides will be quite specific to uh, two assays um, based on questions from the audience. Um, so these slides will cover two commercially available IgG tests, and the Abbott IgG and the Euroimmune IgG. 
If you don't know what assay your lab runs, ask. And you have the basics here to help you interpret along with that FDA website cheat sheet. So Quest runs the Abbott IgG assay. Um, Abbott uses a chemiluminescence technique that targets the nucleocapsid protein and produces a semi-quantitative result based on um, for RLUs. And it's, um, it's given in an SC cutoff. And um, the cutoff index that they determined is 1.4. And the reports will read less than 1.4 as negative and 1.4 or greater as positive. The real meat here is what's the specificity? So this information is taken from Abbott IgG package insert. What Abbott did here is pull samples of positive sera from the above diseases and test them with the SARS-CoV-2 IgG antibody test. They include multiple common respiratory viruses and autoimmune conditions on their list. The bolded lines here indicate other um, respiratory illnesses. And interestingly, there was a single sample that was cross-reactive to CMV IgG. Um, this was quite concerning to Abbott assay developers. So what they did was they um, went back and pulled approximately 200 additional specimens known to be positive for CMV IgG and ran the SARS-CoV-2 IgG antibody test on those samples. And no additional cross-reactivity was seen. Because the seroprevalence of IgG of CMV is about 50% in the population, we would expect um, cr true cross reactivity to be more than that one, um, one sample positivity. Um, in addition to, to the um, evaluation of cross reactivity, they did a negative agreement study. Um, what they did was they took 997 samples of sera prior to the COVID-19 outbreak when presumably no SARS-CoV-2 was circulating and ran it on their assay and found that four of those were um, falsely positive. They also took 73 known um, sera positive for respiratory illnesses and ran those and, and no cross-reactivity was noted there. So based on this data, Abbott determined the specificity of 99.6% and the specificity has um, been demonstrated at, you've probably seen it on the news a couple of different places um, throughout the United States. Um, sensitivity, really, this is a positive agreement study. Um, what they did here was they took 122 um, samples of blood from 31 um, patients who had a SARS-CoV-2 documented by PCR. And they took these samples at a variety of different times from symptom onset. And so you can see here the progression over time. And remember, we're talking about IgM. Um, so you can see the progression over time um, that by day 14, um, all of these 31 patients um, had samples positive for IgG. Moving on to a, a second commercially available assay, um, LabCorp uses this assay also with Abbott. Um, the Euroimmune assay is a based assay that targets the S1 domain of the spike protein. It's revved out in optical density ratio, and it has actually three levels of, of a result. Um, a ratio less than 0.8 is negative, a ratio 0.8 to 1.1 is borderline, and a ratio, I'm sorry, or less than 1.1 is borderline, and a ratio um, 1.1 or greater is positive. So this um, data is from the Euroimmune IgG package insert. Uh, the top table demonstrates patients who are positive for SARS-CoV-2 RNA and their corresponding blood draws um, and their posit the positivity of those blood draws for IgG at that time. You can see that there were fewer patients included in the study, but nonetheless had fairly similar results. Um, there was one patient uh, at day 13 um, who still had not had uh, antibody production um, at, this, at that time. And so that's why the sensitivity is, um, you know, quote unquote low because, um, 
they had a sample of five and, and one person did not seroconvert at day third, had not seroconverted at day 13. Um, they also did a cross reactivity analysis. Um, here, uh, they looked at sera from patients with acute EBV infection, autoantibodies, rheumatoid factor, flu, and bacterial pneumonia. They did note some cross reactivity with autoantibodies and interestingly also against influenza. <clears throat> and uh, this yielded a sensitivity of 98.5%. Um, to further look for um, any sort of cross-reactivity uh, in a negative agreement study, uh, they took healthy blood donors from 2010 and 2017, and children ages 3 to 10, sort of at the beginning of respiratory virus season, just before um, coronavirus hit, when the presumed prevalence um, in Europe was zero, um, and ran these sera on the COVID-2 assay and had resultant um, low level positivity amongst these samples. So about 99% um, correlation there. Um, so overall specificity reported by Euroimmune is 98.5%. So with that, I hopefully haven't bored you to death and have tried to stay within my 30 minutes here. Um, molecular correlation, uh, there, there needs to be much more, um, much more research here. And, and again, a lot of understanding about testing, of um, fine-tuning uh, antibody testing, of fine-tuning collection methods and uh, RT-PCR assays comes with time and, and study. Um, one of the important questions that we need to ask is molecular correlation positivity with transmissibility. How do we, um, how do we interpret those patients that have uh, prolonged viral RNA shedding? Um, and that will really take some transmissions-based um, evaluations. Uh, we need to understand how to appropriately test asymptomatic patients. Um, we need to evaluate and explore home testing, um, given the importance of social distancing in this epidemic. Um, you'll see more uh, discussion on antigen testing. I did not cover that here because it's new and tends to be less sensitive um, compared to molecular diagnostics. Um, Antibody correlation with immunity and with recovery needs to be evaluated and seroprevalence data will hopefully be forthcoming to at least give us some evaluation um, of, of um, disease in our communities. So thank you very much. And I'll turn that, this back over to Dr. Bowles and the next presenter. Thank you, Dr. Garner for tackling up broad topic and uh, we must understand that was excellent. So we'll move on to our final topic, which is vaccines. This topic is being addressed by Dr. Carol Kao. Dr. Kao is an assistant professor with pediatric infectious diseases at Emory University and a co-investigator with the Emory Vaccine Treatment and Evaluation Unit. And her research interests include vaccine effectiveness and maternal vaccines. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Kao. Thank you, Dr. Kao. Great, hey, thank you very much. Um, I guess I'm having some issues sharing my screen. Um, is it possible for the prior presenter to enter screen sharing? I'm sorry. Good job, we can see it. Okay, perfect. All right. And All right, perfect. So I, we are in the home stretch um, and I will just very briefly go over this topic of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. So similar to many other unprecedented events occurring right now in the world, vaccines against SARS-CoV-2 are being developed at rapid speed with the phase one Moderna vaccine trial launched less than 10 weeks after the genetic sequence was first released. 
And as you may have seen in the news, Emory was actually one of three sites uh, in the US that was conducting this trial. And on the right is a photo of an Emory MD PhD student who was one of our very brave volunteers. Uh, so typically a vaccine candidate first undergoes preclinical testing in animal models to determine immunogenicity and safety under good laboratory practices, which with SARS-CoV-2 has been a limitation because there are not great animal models of disease. Then vaccines for humans have to be produced under good manufacturing practices to ensure quality, which requires dedicated facilities, personnel, and materials. And only after that, vaccines can then enter phase one studies to evaluate safety, followed by larger phase two studies, and then phase three studies where efficacy and safety need to be demonstrated in a large cohort prior to vaccine licensure. Uh, even after a vaccine is licensed, uh, it takes time to manufacture, distribute, and then physically administer these vaccines um, to large groups of individuals. So in our current situation, many of these steps are being compressed under the newly formed NIH-sponsored active initiative. Um, the public and the private sectors are collaborating broadly to very quickly generate very essential safety and efficacy data for multiple vaccine candidates in parallel. So in the short term, social distancing measures are decreasing community transmission, but enormous economic costs. As relatively few people are immune to SARS-CoV-2, cases will certainly spike if normal activities resume. And the only long-term way to control SARS-CoV-2 is for enough individuals to become immune to slow transmission through community transmission or herd immunity. And this would require about two thirds of the population to be immune or for a vaccine to eventually become available. So in this recently published paper in Science um, from France, they estimated that as of early May, 4.4% of their total population has been infected with COVID-19. And even if this is an underestimate of the true population prevalence, this does suggest that herd immunity alone is insufficient to avoid future outbreaks. Uh, so much of what we assume about the immune correlates of protection is based on our knowledge of SARS-CoV-1 and MERS. So after SARS-CoV-1 infection, individuals do develop antibodies and neutralizing antibodies against the S protein. And these antibodies can then interfere with binding to the ACE2 receptor. They also develop T cell responses, which were shown to provide long-term protection, even up to 11 years post-infection. Phase one DNA vaccines, inactivated vaccines uh, were tested against SARS and MERS um, in humans and overall shown to be safe. However, these were not further pursued past phase one studies. And more recently, a study from Emory demonstrated that all hospitalized adult patients did make IgG and neutralizing responses against the receptor binding domain of SARS-CoV-2 during the acute phase of infection, which may be an indication that humans do develop protective immunity. And this obviously does have very important implications for future vaccine design. Uh, so I know you are familiar with this picture of the virus. Um, so like SARS and MERS, the recent SARS-CoV-2 is a beta coronavirus and its genome encodes for multiple structural and non-structural proteins. Um, so there are several major vaccine platforms that are being used to create vaccines, traditional recombinant protein vaccines, replicating and non-replicating viral vectors and nucleic acid DNA and mRNA approaches. So each of these vaccine platforms has advantages and disadvantages in regards to the speed and flexibility of manufacturing, the scale and the cost of manufacturing, safety and vaccine reactogenicity, the profile of the immune response that's generated, vaccine stability, um, and culturing requirements. So for example, RNA and DNA-based platforms can be made very quickly because they don't require cell culture. 
However, there are no currently approved RNA vaccines, so this would be a relatively novel technology. Uh, live attenuated vaccines have been used um, and an existing infrastructure does exist. However, these take longer to manufacture and because they are live, safety will need to be very carefully monitored. So just to highlight very briefly, this is um, the Moderna vaccine. So it is a novel lipid nanoparticle encapsulated mRNA vaccine that encodes the full length pre-fusion stabilized spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. It delivers MRA into cells to produce protein antigens. It's non-replicating, expression is transient, so theoretically should mimic wild type viral infection to induce an immune response. And this platform has been used to develop vaccines against CMV, human metanumovirus, parrot influenza, and influenza although none have been licensed. Um, and this vaccine is currently in phase one trials at three US centers with plans for phase two and perhaps phase three um, trials to start as early as this summer. Uh, so this is just a table of an overview of the numerous vaccine candidates that are in phase one and phase two clinical trials. And you can see on the bottom, there are over 100 in preclinical stages of development and updated information about um, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines can be obtained from the WHO draft landscape of COVID-19 vaccine candidates. And so I'll just very briefly touch upon this concept of antibody-dependent enhancement, which was seen in SARS-CoV-1 and MERS vaccinated animals and thought in part due to poorly functioning antibodies or a Th2 skewed immune response to the vaccine. This was also seen um, infamously in very early formalin inactivated RSV vaccine trials in infants, and then more recently in dengue vaccine trials. And whether this will be seen with SARS-CoV-2 um, really remains to be determined. So many outstanding questions remain, um, such as vaccine effectiveness in the real world. So we know, for example, with seasonal influenza that with any given year, we get about 50% um, vaccine effectiveness. However, this is better than zero. Um, and for even for those who get flu that have gotten the vaccine, it still does protect against severe influenza, hospitalization and mortality. Um, such as the previous speakers touched upon, duration of immunity is really unknown. Um, up to 95% of COVID-19 cases do induce some level of antibody and neutralizing antibodies. Um, and with SARS-CoV-1, we know that the neutralizing antibody titers subsisted uh, close to three years and viral specific memory B cells persisted up to six years. Um, the Testing for immunogenicity in diverse populations will be very important. So we know that SARS-CoV-2 causes severe disease in the elderly. So this is obviously a very important population to target. However, we also know that they respond poorly to vaccines due to immune senescence, and they often require higher doses or the need for an adjuvant dose, adju adjuvanted vaccines. Um, and then a few practical issues that have been highlighted in the news. Um, so how quickly and how much vaccine can be produced. So likely upfront, there will be a short supply of vaccine and healthcare systems will have to come up with strategies of which populations to target. So is this healthcare workers, the elderly, those with high risk conditions? Um, cost and vaccine hesitancy are also issues that have been in the news recently. Um, and then very importantly, short and long-term safety uh, will need to be carefully monitored as many of these clinical trials are being fast-tracked. Um, so this is a very rapidly evolving field. However, it's very encouraging that many scientific fields worldwide are collaborating together um, to reach a common goal. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kao, for an excellent presentation. So let's move on to some of the questions that we have gotten through chat. And one that was answered by Dr. Kandaya, I think is an interesting question for the group. So Dr. Kandaya will 
direct this question to you, and that is what data are there on the relative severity of uh, patients who are immunosuppressed at baseline who become infected with COVID-19? Is there any evidence that the immunosuppression can be protective against that inflammatory response, or are these patients more at risk? That's a great answer to share, I think, with the group. I'm not sure if Dr. Kendaya had to drop off. So we'll move on to another question and we can go back to that one. Uh, Dr. Garner, there are a lot of questions about the sensitivity and specificity of rapid testing. And then even that uh, here in Atlanta at Mercedes-Benz Stadium, it looks like they're doing saliva testing. So could you comment on some of the, uh, you know, there was a question of whether that's an antigen test. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Okay. Um, so I think it, you have to really separate tests into the, the category of procedure um, in order to really understand sensitivity and specificity because they really are going to vary based on the methodology. Um, PCR testing in general, um, you know, it's quite specific. Uh, rarely do we have um, cross-reactivity from PCR-based uh, testing. And so if you're talking about a molecular diagnostic platform, um, in general, those tend to be pretty solid. Um, the specificity, um, I'm sorry, the, the sensitivity of molecular diagnostics uh, is, is the thing that's concerning and typically depends on collection methodology and then the lower level um, virus that you have shedding, depending on the assay, um, some, some assays are better at detecting low level of shedding compared to others. Um, and that's where, you know, a lot of this news about ID now has come out, um, their ability to detect sort of the lower level of um, shedding, um, particularly if the sample was diluted in a transport media has been, been questioned. And that really is a rapid test um, a, along with uh, things like Gene Expert um, by Cepheid, which has very good performance characteristics. So, you know, it really is um, dependent assay to assay. So that's why it's really important for you to have a good relationship with the lab that you're sending your PCR tests to. Um, antibody testing, very similar, except you kind of flip the testing characteristic that you're concerned about, um, which is the specificity. And um, for those uh, antibody testing, antibody tests that are available that have undergone um, FDA uh, EUA, um, I put a link there uh, to a little cheat sheet that shows you mathematical breakout based on a prevalence rate of 5% as far as the positive predictive value of the test and the negative predictive value of the test. So make sure you're using those sorts of resources when you're interpreting. Antigen testing, you know, it's just so new. I, I, I don't know that I can comment much on it other than in general, antigen tests um, can be easier to perform, but again, um, commonly uh, are at the sacrifice of good performing characteristics. So they tend to be less sensitive and less specific than PCRs for acute diagnosis. I will say that the one that is currently on the market by um, Cadell Laboratories um, still requires a nasal swab. So operationally, um, it's not quite, it's not so different from a molecular diagnostic study anyways. So saliva, back to saliva, that's pretty interesting. Um, I highlighted sort of the, the um, pooled analysis. Um, it's, it's hard to know at this point in time if it's sufficient as a standalone specimen. There's good data out from um, a couple of different places, including uh, the Wadsworth Institute in New York, um, that recommends sort of co-collection of saliva along with mesopharyngeal um, uh, swab to help increase your sensitivity. Um, and there are many institutions where um, saliva is just collected in a conical 
tube and sent down into sent down to the lab to be combined with nasopharyngeal samples. Um, I think one thing to caution is that you don't want the tube to be too skinny and you, it needs to be kind of a, a direct um, you know, sample to test because there is no transport media. Um, if the tube is too skinny, the outside becomes uh, contaminated easily and puts your lab workers at risk for transmission. Thank you so much. Dr. Kendai, thanks for rejoining uh, uh, the question about immunosuppression at baseline and whether that's protective. Interesting question. Yeah, so I was, I think I did answer it in the chat. I'm sorry, I should probably should have waited till the end. But you know, I, I looked at this specifically yesterday, and I think that's actually part of the part of the issue is um, using monoclonal antibodies, which are immunosuppressives for both there, there's uh, people who are looking at using it both for treatment as well as prevention. Um, and exactly for the reason of suppressing the, the dysfunctional immune response. The issue is that some of these uh, monoclonal antibodies can actually be pro-inflammatory, so it's they need to actually balance the um, anti-inflammatory the, with the immunosuppression, or excuse me, the immunosuppressive effects um, with the infl inflammation, and that's what's going on um, currently. But there are, there's, there, you know, there's obviously many steps in the inflammation cascade, and there's, um, it's kind of interesting because, you know, both the B, B cell immunity and your T cell immunity are involved with, um, with COVID-19 and what, you know, it's sort of almost like, hey, this looks like a good step to try and block and see if it makes a difference. And, you know, there's emerging evidence for complement inhibition as well, um, which is actually cheaper than some of the IL-6 inhibitors, because um, I know that sometimes um, things like tocilizumab can be um, cost prohibitive. Um, but it's very early, and I think there's studies being looked at for patients who are on Humira, um, which is a TNF inhibitor, um, to see whether they actually perform better for those who are infected with COVID, if their outcomes are better. But nothing yet. It's coming, I think, very soon. Great. Thank you. All right. We had a question for uh, Dr. Ramstetter. Uh, as far as epidemiology, why do minorities and African Americans do uh, poorly with COVID infection, Dr. Branstetter? Excellent observation. Um, recent reports from MMWR have highlighted that racial and ethnic uh, data um, is showing that there's some disparities um, and may um, highlight um, some underlying issues that are already there. So certainly uh, the full understanding of why this is occurring is not there. But what we do know is that public health emergencies and pandemics such as COVID-19 do highlight underlying disparities in health um, that already exist. So uh, not a complete answer, but certainly um, highlighting some of those disparities that we need to make up as far as the world goes. Thank you. Uh, there was a great question. That, that was a great question. Good answer. And uh, there was a great question for uh, Dr. Kao about uh, the vaccine studies that uh, I see that you answered, but maybe want to answer for the group uh, about as far as who's participating in the vaccine study. Sure. So um, the vaccine study with Moderna is being run through um, the vaccine treatment and evaluation units. And these are NIH sponsored sites uh, across the United States um, whose purpose is, is, exists to provide uh, existing infrastructure to kind of run clinical trials for vaccines of pandemic importance. Um, so they exist basically to do exactly what's going on right now. Great, thank you. There's a question for the group, maybe more for Dr. Garner and that's, um, you know, how should we approach asymptomatic patients who are starting to come back for elective procedures, uh, specifically, uh, you know, should they be tested and what, how would that, I think you pointed out, may not change the plan, but if you could comment on that, that's a real common question. I think the jury is still out. Um, you know, about what the best thing to do is here. Um, certainly there's a large push to understand uh, what the patient's status is at the time of operation because it may um, influence personal protective equipment during the case. And certainly um, if the patient doesn't need the surgery and can wait, it's more elective, um, you know, because we don't 
truly understand um, you know, outcomes in patients that are operated on in the middle of being COVID positive, how that all pans out. And because we also don't have a great way to, to uh, differentiate between those that won't develop symptoms and those who will eventually become symptomatic, again, it, it's, it's difficult to say what, what the best thing to do is with that information once you have it. Um, ultimately, you know, we've decided to go ahead and begin testing patients um, for pre-procedures based on, um, you know, trying to conserve PPE where we can. Um, and again, because our prevalence rate is unclear at this point in time and is probably somewhere under 10%, we, we are not testing all patients that come into the hospital, um, but are testing pre-procedure patients, um, mainly because of PPE and the unclear um, outcomes that the patient may have postoperatively, particularly with um, complicating factors like COVID associated coagulopathy and, and things like that that may complicate a post-op course. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you all again. We, we are at time. It's 1.30. I just want to mention that this presentation will be available afterwards on the YouTube channel Palmcast, as well as the website www.palmcast.com. And they'll also have a CME uh, certificate sent uh, if you pre-registered. So thank you all, and I hope everybody has a great weekend. Great experts. Thank you. Bye.